Ladies and gentlemen, this is certainly a pleasure for myself and the crew, but again, we're doing a documentary with Dr. Barry Fell, a gentleman that has, as far as I am concerned, has expanded epigraphy and many other um, uh, ancient artifacts, languages, and the young people of this nation and the world should be very appreciative of this, as many of you are, I know that. But it just is really a blessing to be able to have this knowledge available in Dr. Barry Fell at, of the Epigraphic Society. Dr. Fell, thank you for allowing us back again. It's and a pleasure. We're looking forward to this. We appreciate your work so very, very much. Well, Arnold, we're very grateful to you and your crew, too, because you're bringing our work to the attention of thousands of people who would never hear about it otherwise. Well, thank you. So, it is our pleasure. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the continuation of a program that uh, Dr. Ar uh, Arnold Murray enabled me to do three years ago dealing with the decipherment of some mysterious tablets found in Easter Island and uh, which had not been deciphered up to that time. Today we're going to take the work forward for the work that's been done in the intervening three years and then as we shall see later on we're going to have to uh, expand the area of investigation to cover much more of the Pacific than where we started. Easter Island is a part of the Polynesian Triangle, as it's called, as you see in the map there. New Zealand at the southwest corner, Hawaii in the north corner, and Easter Island in the eastern corner. A, a huge area of the Pacific, uh, over which there are hundreds of islands scattered, all with people speaking dialects of the Polynesian language. Obviously, that's because their ancestors sailed to all the different islands where they now are. The island, Easter Island, is famous for another reason, more famous still for its gigantic statues, which have always been a matter of mystery to visitors to the island. Huge statues arranged in rows or standing sick, sick, singly, carved from volcanic rock by the original inhabitants of the island. The tablets which carried the mysterious writing, some of them are illustrated there. The smaller ones in the picture are modern copies made by modern Eastern Islanders for sale to tourists and they do not really read correctly because at the present time they don't know how to write their ancient language. The big one underneath is one of the a reproduction of one of the original tablets which is full of information of a most interesting type recorded by their ancestors. The uh, subject matter that I dealt with in my last talk was, the, was that same big tablet, which was the one where I was able to crack the code. I was able to do it because about 150 or 60 years ago, a treaty called the Treaty of Waitangi was signed in New Zealand by the Maoris with Queen Victoria and the hundreds of Maori chieftains reigning over different parts of the islands signed their names. The missionaries wrote the name out in uh, en English script and the Maoris often wrote their names in their own system. And it was possible to deduce by studying some of the signatures that what the Maoris were writing was pictures of objects which can be depicted in pictures which sound something like their names. And if you say the names of the objects depicted, you then get sounds that are very similar to the name of the person concerned. Uh, adapting that principle, I was able to uh, apply it to the uh, Easter Island tablets. And in my last broadcast on this subject, I dealt with the discovery of the islands by the uh, expeditions led by King Hotu, 
around about 800 AD in uh, huge seagoing canoes like the ones you see in this picture drawn by a brilliant German artist who worked in Polynesia a century ago called Ditmer. Ditmer's picture here depicts the departure of great canoes on an exploring voyage. Such a voyage was carried out by King Hotu who discovered the islands and settled them, Easter Island. The next tablet that I dealt with handled a widespread Polynesian myth about their folk hero Maui who is supposed to have brought up land from the bottom of the sea by fishing. The fascinating thing is that these Maui myths were unknown from Easter Island although they were found all over the Pacific the one remarkable thing about Easter Island is that they seem to have no knowledge of their great folk hero Maui so it was a real surprise to find him mentioned on the tablets. His most famous uh, exploit was to go fishing with his brothers with a magic fish hook and uh, with it he was able to bring up a gigantic fish from the bottom of the sea and uh, he slew it and then it became the island wherever the legend is being related it's that island that he brought up in New Zealand it was the North Island of New Zealand and in the other islands it was always the island where the story is being related yes, uh, the particular myth I'm talking about the fishing up of the land from the bottom of the sea is discussed in the largest of those tablets that you saw in the original picture a few uh, frames ago and this is what the actual writing looks like on the tablet and this, that, that amount of it and then there's the episode as depicted by Dittmer who of course did not know what was on this tablet he got it from uh, verbal uh, sources then 150 years ago a, an Easter Island chieftain dictated to a bishop of a French bishop of Polynesia what he said was on that on that tablet and that's all written out there now it doesn't make any sense at all what he was doing was giving the names of each of the pictures in these um, each of the pictograms in these uh, hieroglyphic texts over here which made no sense to the bishop or anybody else uh, and in uh, the job that I have done I had to identify how each line each statement he made was similar to a statement that made sense and so uh, these couplets these pairs of uh, Ta writings here always the second line is the one giving the intended meaning and then you end up with a translation these uh, papers published year by year since we last uh, did this program have appeared in the various volumes of ESOP ESOP the epigraphic society occasional papers some of which are laid out on the table here and uh, the first of the ones that I did was this one of the fishing up of the sea. The next uh, episode in the life of Maui that I found on that same tablet was his famous exploit of capturing the sun. In those far off days when heroes lived and gods walked on the land, the sun was said to have speeded across the sky at any speed it happened to find convenient very inconvenient for the human inhabitants below so Maui took it upon himself to trap the sun at the point on the horizon where he rose caught him with ropes and uh, tied him down as it's shown in this imaginative picture by Ditma of the capture of the sun and uh, wounded him so severely that ever since he's only been able to move slowly across the sky and that was the story of the regulating of the length of the days the next uh, legend I came across in the readings of the tablets dealt with how Maui brought fire to men. Through some accident, which the legend explains in detail on the tablet, all the fires went out one night and nobody was able to uh, cook any food anymore. Everybody had to eat raw food and they were very cold at night. Um, so Maori once more came to the rescue by doing a dangerous journey up a mountain and from there he leapt up into the sky and sailed his canoe across the Milky Way 
until he came to the land of fire where he met his remote ancestor, the fire goddess, from whom he then, through various tricks, stole fire and brought it back to mankind. The legend is in given in detail on the slide. I'm only giving you a summary of these things. And he had an adventurous trip back home as the goddess chased him. And he uh, had to turn himself into a bird and uh, escape that way. And there he is. Uh, there is the picture Ditma drew of his ancestress, the fire goddess, who gave him one of her fingers, fingers flame, as you see there. Uh, he kept, by playing tricks, he kept throwing the finger away until she'd ended up by giving him every single one of her fingers. By this time she was furious, and that's when the great chase started across the sky. The next tablet I dealt with is one that they call in Easter Island Mamari. When it's supposed to be the name of the person who engraved it, but I really don't believe that. I think it's called Mamari for another reason. On this tablet, I found the uh, writing was ar arranged in quite a different way. And setting it out the way we would punctuate it on a European style of publication, it uh, came out like that. A series of short phrases with the same phrase, same part of the phrase repeated in every line. It turned out that these were spells to be cast by what in America would be called a medicine man. In the Polynesian areas is called a tohunga. In Easter Island and New Zealand, tohunga. Or in Hawaii he's called a kahuna. A medicine man who has magic powers. Here he is shown by Ditma such a medicine man is shown by Ditma casting spells in front of an image of one of the Maori gods. Another job that uh, the Tohung carried out was to make sure that the weather was good. He could cast spells to calm stormy seas or uh, produce a, a wind blowing in the required direction when a voyage was about to be undertaken and so forth. Such the legends say. Now we had a surprise was looming up for us. This map of the Polynesian Triangle shows more detail and is probably harder to see on the screen than the simpler one that I showed before. I'm showing it because I want you to see that while Easter Island is at the eastern extremity of a triangle, in the middle of a triangle is what we call nuclear Polynesia and the principal island right at the center is Tahiti often called Society Islands, Tahiti. Our attention is going to be suddenly drawn away from Easter Island to Tahiti. This came about because by chance when uh, reading a book about uh, the French artist Paul Gauguin with no idea that I was going to find anything of concern to me, I came across this picture of a painting which is now in the Art Institute in Chicago depicting his Tahitian wife, Gauguin, the painter Paul Gauguin's Tahitian wife called Tehamana and I could see there was Easter Island writing behind her. This was astonishing because he was painting in Tahiti about 2,000 miles away from Easter Island. He never went, went to Easter Island. How could it come about? He lived in a different period from when the Easter Island chief dictated the tablets to the uh, French bishop. He was living much later. The, he, um, the chieftain was in Tahiti around 1860, whereas Gauguin did not go to eat Tahiti till about 1893 or thereabouts. So this was a great mystery. The first thing was to set about deciphering it. Uh, looking carefully at the picture, at a particular section of it, which I'm showing there, we found the Polynesian words written in French characters which read in uh, Polynesian the many ancestors of Tehamana that's written out in ordinary Latin letters you can see part of that there so my guess was there must have been some tablet or other in the possession of his wife Tehamana or her family giving her ancestry 
as set out in the Easter Island writing above, in the upper part of the picture, and uh, his wife must have told uh, Paul Gauguin that that's what it said, so he wrote it down in Polynesian writing in ordinary European script, and then painted a copy of what I suppose would be the tablet inherited by his wife from her ancestors. It turns out that if you apply to that um, Easter Island inscription, as it seems to be, the same sound values that uh, the Easter Island chieftain assigned to them at the time when the bishop wrote out that dictionary that I described in the last uh, program on this subject, if you give those sound values to those uh, letters there, you can quickly see that the characters, in fact, do match the Easter Island characters. There is the, the actual painting uh, drawn out in the middle, and above each of the supposedly Easter Island characters is the Easter Island way of writing it. It's easy to match them. And then using the sound values that the uh, chief gave us so long ago, we can arrive at a Polynesian statement. It became apparent when doing that that we're dealing not with Easter Island dialect of Polynesian, but certain words were in the Tahitian dialect. And that when you render them that way, you get back the following statement. It says, The many ancestors of Tehamana, powerful men of property, drummers, men of importance, warriors bold, as well as others long since forgotten. Well, this is very interesting. How could it be that this statement, written in Easter Island script, but in Tahitian dialect, had existed somewhere, no one had ever seen it, and Paul Gauguin had apparently been able to make a copy of it. Uh, having worked out what it said, we then made it the subject of one of the articles in an issue of Aesop, and we used Paul Gauguin's painting as the cover of that particular issue, as you see there. About that time, I received a wonderful letter from uh, chieftains, a chiefly family, who has one of whose members was a judge, uh, Jock McCulloch is his European name, living in the um, central part of Polynesia in an island north of New Zealand called Rarotonga. And they sent me a gift. Uh, they sent the gift of this ancient Polynesian adze carved in whalebone. It was an heirloom, an heirloom which they then were so generous as to give to me to wear. And this is what they wrote. This is what they wrote. It's Jock McCulloch is the European name of the writer. And his wife is Akatina. She's a, a, a um, chieftain in the Rarotonga hierarchy. He says, enclosed as a whalebone pendant given by a family in New Zealand in appreciation for our compiling a whakapapa. A whakapapa is a family tree. A whakapapa for them. They did say that the toki was symbolic and referred to construction, not only of wood, but history, and all that pertained thereto. I feel that your Easter Island work has made you a tohonga. You, are, you have felled the tree of ignorance and surrounding uh, truth, which is, um, pardon me, and surrounding the Easter Island pictographic carvings. So we give you this token and the uweru which is a chant to give you strength and determination. This is what I learned at the island of Enuamanu, where I served for some years as the government agent from 1961 till 1967. And he then gives me the wording of the Ueru, which is a chant. It starts off, Erongo etane, ke ikutaku toki, ke tua kititumu o te waka. I won't continue to read it in uh, Polynesian. And here is the translation. It's addressed to two gods, Rongo, the god of the sky, and Tane, the god of the forest. O Rongo, O Tane, cradle in your arms my ads. Let the heart of the tree be separated. Let my ads allow the light to enter the heart of the tree. Let my ads cleave a groove in the center of the tree. 
Let my ads gaze into the center of a tree. Let the heart of a tree take a part, face a part, O Rongo, O Taku, O Tane. My ads is now asleep. It rests pillowed in the arms of Maukate, the westerly wind. Well, that wonderful token from Polynesia, it sure did, did give me strength to carry on with my decipherments. However, from some of the decipherments I had done, I realized that I'm no Tohunga at all. Um, I may be able to read some obscure material, but I can't do such things as raising a wind. <laughs> raising a wind when it's required from a given direction or causing the full moon to shine or causing the moon to go behind a cloud if it's inconvenient and so forth. So I'm only, a, only a, um, an apprentice as far as tohungas go. The, um, the ads that they sent me, this beautiful little uh, ivory ads, came in a packet which almost um, uh, symbolically it seemed to me carried two postage stamps, both of them to do with the early church in Polynesia. One on the right hand side is a portrait of a Monsignor who uh, was establishing the Catholic Church in uh, Polynesia and the one on the left, as you can see, depicts the crucifixion of Christ. It was issued by the Cook Islands, which is the group to which Rarotonga belongs, like my letter came from Rarotonga, and was issued at the time at the uh, Easter time, so it's, it's appropriate of course. So there are not many places which show the crucifixion on their stamps. The next event in this uh, unexpected series of events is that I received a letter from a colleague of mine in Texas, Professor George Carter, whom you see there, telling me that he had just come across most unexpectedly a picture of another work by Gauguin, not a painting, a carving this time. And he sent it to me, sent me the picture. It depicted the crucifixion of Christ with, again, what appeared to be Easter Island letters on either side. Now, he was the first person who had noticed that in this uh, work of Gauguin, known for so long, yet no one had detected that it had so-called Easter Island script on it. Well. Dogan, of course, lived in Tahiti, so by this time I was prepared to expect it to be in the Tahitian dialect, which proved to be correct. Furthermore, it was reading the way European inscriptions are written, that is, say it started at the top left and read right across to the right, then you went to the second line down, beginning at the left, and read across to the right, and so on. So uh, George Carter sent me the picture and invited me to see whether I could decipher it. My first comment on the telephone was, oh, I'll try to, but it won't, there won't be time to do it for this issue of ESOP. It'll be too difficult a job. And there I was totally mistaken. As soon as I started on it, I realized immediately it would be very simple to do. First thing, I had to write out the um, signs that you saw in the crucifix there, taking them in the order in which they appear, and writing them out in horizontal lines and then numbering each one. Then we dealt with each sign separately and it's so simple and straightforward that I'd really like to go through it with an audience because I think you'll find it a wonderful way to get to know how Easter Island writing and other Polynesian writing such as Tahitian can be deciphered. The first signs on the left, number, numbers one and two, you see them at the top left there. Now go back to the signs again. Uh, number one is a ring. So you say the word for ring in Tahitian. The word for ring in Tahitian is tipea. The part is, represents K in other parts of Polynesia. So where you say tipea in, Pol in uh, Tahiti, you would say tipeka in New Zealand. Tipea. But tipea is a homophone, that is to say, it sounds the same. It's a homophone of te pea, which means the cross. So, of course, as you can guess, as soon as I saw that uh, parallel, I said, hey, this is going to deal with a Christian topic which we've never encountered in Polynesia before. This has been written in modern times. 
The next two signs, the next sign rather, is a palm frond for which the Tahitian word is Tamara. But Tamara is a homophone of Tamara, which means blessed son. Now in reading Easter Island writing or Tahitian writing, you have to supply the little prepositions or intermediate minor words yourself. So what this is saying is the cross of the blessed son. S-O-N. And we go to the next uh, part of the uh, top line. That, the first sign is uh, number three. Now that was given by Metura, Metura, the chief who visited Tahiti in 1860. He gave that in his list of symbols he gave the bishop and he told him that meant God, Atua. And the next sign is one that we've encountered also on this on the painting of his wife. It occurred on that one too. A uh, person sitting, pronounced Noho in Easter Island, but in the Tahitian dialect, Arahi. So it gives um, uh, Noho Arahi. But that is the same, that has almost exactly the same sign, sound rather, as the Tahitian words meaning to pray. So we're getting a translation now which says it's the cross of the blessed Son of God praying for, and now we're going to the next sign. That sign we've encountered in a previous program. It um, means uh, um, uh, pardon me, where are we? Fetu. It means Fetu. And when we encountered it in Eastern Ireland it was Hetu, meaning a star. The Tahitian dialect is not Hetu, but Fetu, Fetu. So it, we read it as Fetu, but Fetu is a perfect, almost perfect, homophone, sounding the same, as Thatu, which means our Lord. The next sign... Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that one, I'll go back one. The next sign to it, number six on the screen, is a symbol for a dog. A dog in Easter Island is curry. It's curry in New Zealand too. But in, Hawaii, in uh, Tahiti where they drop the K it becomes uri. Uri with a jerk in front of it. But that's a homophone of ura meaning life or salvation or redemption. The next sign after that, number seven, it's a stem or a stalk for which the Tahitian word is fa, and sign number eight gives the Tahitian word ora with that uh, sense. Sign seven and eight taken together yield the word fa ora. But fa ora, that's two words, but if you put them together to make one word, you get a new word, which means to forgive or forgiveness. Come to signs 9 and 10 now. The ninth sign is a bird, Manu, same word in New Zealand and Easter Island. But it's also a homophone of Manu, meaning many, or very many. Sign number 10, twisted, can be rendered as Pio, Pio in Tahitian, Pico in New Zealand, Pio in Tahitian. But Pio has a second meaning, sins. Then we come to the next two signs, 11 and 12. These have to be taken together and uh, yield a, a homophone which um, one says little chick and the other one is bad. But if you say those two words together, ti ao, you get another homo you get another homophone which means of the world. So this last series we've been doing is Our Lord prays for our salvation and for the forgiveness of the countless sins of the world. Coming now to sign 13, tendrils called nape, and 14, this is a flying bird, which uh, the, the Easter Island chief told it to be pronounced rero timanu, flying, the bird is flying. 
these signs together give you Nape Reira thus and the pain or suffering thus the suffering and then the last signs 15 and 16 15 is a spider Tirahu with 16 ara a branch to form Tirahu ara spider branch but that's a homophone of the Tahitian word meaning Tirahuara, the Saviour. Such were the sufferings of the Saviour. Now, how did this happen? It's obvious that my earlier theory that Tehamana, his wife, had a copy of some ancient um, genealogy of her family and that um, Gauguin had been allowed to copy it. So that won't work anymore. Because here we have a whole series of Christian terms that weren't used in ancient Polynesia. And so I had to hunt through all the ancient dictionaries and look through the early editions of the Bible and Polynesian scripts, Polynesian translations of the Bible, to find these words. And I found they all dated back to about 1830 at the earliest in the various islands. So it couldn't possibly be older than that. And all the indications are it was Paul Gauguin himself, the carver of the crucifix, who made it up himself. That's the only way we can account for it. So apparently he didn't just have a piece of uh, engraved wood given to him by his wife. He was taught how to read and write Polynesian script, something that's totally unknown. It's been, lead, been believed right up till now that no modern person could read the tablets. And as for writing them, it didn't even enter into our ideas. So this, of course, raises a question. How did uh, Paul Gauguin achieve this? So I began to... Uh, read all I could about Gauguin and look at uh, books about his life and his paintings. There is a, a self-portrait that he did. And uh, here we have a, a tropical painting by him. Now, what I had understood about him was that he grew up in France and later went to Tahiti and became interested in tropical scenes and Polynesian scenes then. Turns out my, my ideas were a bit wrong. He was uh, born in France, of course, served his uh, military training during the war with uh, Germany, the Franco-Prussian War. Then he became a sailor, an able seaman, and made voyages to various parts of the world. One of his voyages in 1887 took him to the island of Martinique, in the Caribbean and to Panama and whilst there he did the earliest of his paintings that we know of of tropical vegetation this particular one this is not Tahiti this is either Martinique or Panama then he went back to France and uh, for the next uh, eight or nine years from about 1888 onwards was painting pictures many of them of French peasantry especially in Brittany. Here are peasants harvesting uh, scenes in Brittany. Now, to my surprise, we encounter a crucifix once again. He painted an imaginary painting of the crucifixion occurring in Brittany. I can't get the whole picture into this one slide, so we move now to the next frame, which shows Brit Brit uh, Breton peasants praying at the foot of a cross in Brittany. So we can detect from that that Paul Gauguin had a strong religious sense and also a fantastic view of uh, how religion might be viewed set with this imaginary crucifixion in Brittany. Here's another scene in Brittany. Then all of a sudden he took upon himself to leave France and uh, in 18, 1891 he made a voyage to Tahiti, leaving behind his family, uh, most of whom had gone to Denmark by this time, travelling alone to Tahiti, where he embarked upon a whole new life, 
adopting a common law Tahitian wife would not be legal under European systems, of course, but was perfectly legal in Tahiti. Um, and so he came to know uh, Tehamana, his wife. Almost as soon as he got to um, Tahiti, he immersed himself in studies of Polynesian mythology and religion and began to write this notebook of which we see pages here. This book is preserved now in the Louvre in Paris. He, the page that's open on the left is uh, dealing with the gods and the birth of the gods as he has there, he's writing in French and more of them there. So he be soon became very well informed about uh, Tahitian traditions. He uh, painted many, many pictures of Tahitians, as if most of us are familiar with seeing at least some of them. But he also took out woodcuts. This one is interesting because it shows his signature in the form of a cartouche, PG, a cartouche on the upper left there, which matches the one you, we saw at the foot of the crucifix when we first became aware of that. And uh, an unknown person made this drawing of uh, Gauguin in the act of carving wood. He took up wood carving after he went to Tahiti. And here's an example of one of the carvings he made of a traditional Tahitian god. Here we are seeing him again, seeing his wife again with the uh, inscription which he had copied as I supposed, from her archives in which we now realize he very probably composed himself. How could that be? Uh, and the, the picture before, I obtained a copy of a book called Noah Noah, in which he gives an account of his life in Tahiti. Noa Noa means fragrance, he liked to call Tahiti Island of Fragrance. Uh, he gives an account there of his life with Tehamana, who is obviously much more than just a wife. This passage occurs in Tehamana and struck me as important. He says, through her, that's Tehamana, I enter into mysteries that have hitherto remained inaccessible to me. She leads me to a full understanding of her race. We talk of God and of gods. I instruct her and she in turn instructs me. I believe that what we have to read into that is that totally contrary to what we previously believed about Polynesian writing, it was much more widely distributed than we originally supposed, not confined only to Easter Island, but it existed in other forms such as this Tahitian form with Tahitian dialect words which was known to people living in Tahiti in the 1890s and that one of those persons must have been his wife Tehamana who instructed her husband into the mystery of Polynesian writing very much as he himself says in Noa Noa but also must have told him that he had to keep it secret. So he could not be explicit in that account he gave in Noah Noah as to just what these mysteries were that he'd learned. We now know from the materials he left behind that it must have been the Easter Island script which he not only learned to read but recognized it as having a Tahitian form and learned to write it. Tehamana must uh, now become a major figure in Polynesian, modern Polynesian history, a major link with the past, and through her talent and her learning ability and her ability to teach, he, she taught her husband to read the secrets of her race, and he produced evidences of uh, such a character which delighted me because they show clearly that the method I had derived for reading Easter Island script is correct because it works exactly the same way with the Tahitian examples. So this was a, a great comfort to me. And uh, the crucifixion of Christ 
has a um, strange uh, resonance to it. It appears three times in the story from three different sources. Now, a few years ago, when I first learned to read Easter Island writing, it occurred to me that it might be possible to instruct the young people of Easter Island to read and write it if we could encourage the cooperation of the Catholic priest in that island because it seemed to me he would be in charge of education. It's a very tiny island, there are very few people there. So one had to think very carefully how to go about this. You may remember from our previous program that I had had encouraging letters from the native council of chiefs of Easter Island that they believed that this was the correct way to read their tablets. I thought that perhaps if um, I could find a way of interesting the priest on the island in the subject, he might use uh, a sample of the script that I wrote to teach with. The question, was, question is, have I written it correctly? Is there anybody who could uh, vet the sample that I attempted to produce? The whiteboard in this picture laid below the other ones, the other ones are the old wooden boards. The whiteboard is a, a modern piece of wood on which I have drawn out characters composed in the same way as I see uh, Gauguin composed his writing by turning to religion, believing that through Christian religion we could get at the people who are very devout Christians in, in Easter Island. And so I made an attempt to write the um, Lord's Prayer in uh, Easter Island script. And uh, I did send it out to uh, Rarotonga to ask if they would vet it to see if they gave their, their approval to it. Unfortunately, the uh, judge with whom I was communicating, Jock McCulloch, was taken ill and uh, had to go to New Zealand for a heart operation at that time. So we didn't make much progress. However, Gauguin has come to my rescue, and I see from what he did that obviously what I was doing was on the right track. I wrote my tablet out in the traditional way, that's starting at the bottom right-hand corner and reading along to the left, and then you have to turn it right around through 180 degrees and go back again in the reverse direction. That's the traditional way of writing. Um, Gauguin, you remember, just converted it to the modern European way of reading from left to right. I did it the old way. And starting at the lower right-hand corner and reading along, the signs I have read there are homophones intended to sound like intended to sound like Tomatu Matua, which is uh, our father, Inohuana, who lives, Kitirangi, in the sky, Kiatapu to Ingoa, may it be ble may it be hallowed your name, and so on. I won't go through the whole Lord's Prayer. Well, after seeing what. Gauguin did, I no longer feel bashful about disclosing that piece of my own attempt at reading, at writing Easter Island writing. Uh, I don't believe it's too bad. So this is the first occasion in which I've been able to give it a public airing. Dr. Phil, what, what an exciting find to, and how thankful we are for you, giving us a double witness, if, if you would, to the Easter Island tablets and that is I think it will I think it is a monumental find in causing us to open our minds to the travels and migrations of various people I see a very interesting tool here could you explain to us what this is it's um, yes I learned from the records made by the early visitors to Easter Island that the Easter Islanders at that time, and talking about 150 years ago, still remembered how their tablets were written, even though they no longer wrote them themselves. They said that the uh, scribe, who had, had to be a tohunga, a priest, had to have a um, shark's tooth embedded in the tip of a piece of wood, and he engraved by cutting away, shark's teeth are very sharp and very hard, cutting away and producing the grooves that way. This is one example of several uh, such tools I made myself. Wow, that is exciting. And I'll, 
Thanks for sharing this with us, and what a what a honor and well deserved by you, sir. And um, I think that is, I, I can see how you would treasure this mm -hmm. certainly because of the work you have done in the Pacific areas and so forth. And I know from the people there how much they appreciate you also. And because this this gives us a full circle in a sense that many might say well those were natives in the South Pacific or in the Pacific and here we have many thoughts that we even carry in modern day written in that alphabet so I, I think that is interesting I would I would like also to say and to take advantage of this opportunity to say this is Aesop this is a cattle is a book put out by the Epigraphic Society and you see in this the very picture that has to do with this subject. This particular issue of Aesop has 336 pages. If you want to be informed my friends and help preserve some of the ancient history, uh, cultures, and herit the heritage of various people in both this hemisphere, the Pacific and other places, Europe, the migrations, the travels of people, I certainly recommend that you contact the Epigraphic Society of whom Dr. Fell founded and what, what a work it is. I don't know how many back issues but it is published uh, a couple of three issues a year, isn't it? Uh, no, no, only one a year now. Only one a year. Uh, so it's an, it's an annual, and yeah. we're up to 20, volume 22 now. Volume 22. But what a vast amount of information. You're not going to find anywhere else much of this information. And so I highly want to recommend that many of you subscribe to ESOF because you're going to, you're going to receive an education that you're not going to find anywhere else. It is the fact in my travels that Dr. Fell does not is not a loose cannon on the deck by any means. He double documents everything to the point that truth is truth and truth will always stand on its own. So I want to take this advantage of this opportunity because of this wonderful talk and I hope you can grasp the importance of a second witness to the translation of the Easter Island tablets and certainly Barry I know you must be very proud and I for one want to thank you for oh, your efforts no, in it's that. a pleasure we're grateful what to you fine. for your cooperation what a fine. may I add one thing to what you were sure. saying about Aesop uh, many people can't afford the price $32.50 it costs us to produce each volume but what would be helpful if people are able to advise local libraries on what they could buy, if local libraries could uh, subscribe, um, that is one way in which uh, could be distributed more widely. We do send it to about 200 libraries now. Uh, 50, uh, 80, 80 of those are in overseas countries and the remainder are mostly museums or university libraries in North America and Canada. But uh, many, many more libraries uh, could very well do with this volume if they had the funds to spend $32.50 a year on it. Or if they really want it, we would uh, donate it to them. Well, it's, and I know there are many of you out there that um, can afford to purchase one of these for your library. Read it yourself and then pass it on. I would say this, I know many of you are serious students and once you have it you're not going to pass it on, but consider, that's, that's a good lay work, is, is uh, buying one for yourself and one for your local library where the young people that study there can have this rich heritage. And I'll tell you, with the ancient writings being protected as slack, as slack as they are at this time, which by that I mean so many people in ignorance desecrate ancient writings of one form or the other. And if a young person is educated in the value in history and love and just mankind, the fact that 
mankind left a message that is really important, then this in itself will help preserve the heritage of not only the Americas, but Europe itself and the Pacific. And um, so uh, you may contact the society with the address that will be on the, the screen at the end of this, uh, this uh, documentary. Here is the current volume, uh, Dr. Murray, oh, yes. in which for the first time we have been able to encourage young people directly. These are two students in Wyoming who prepared an archaeological, an exhibit for their archaeological com competition this past year. Uh, so a very good exhibit illustrating the principles of the work we're doing. And uh, it came to the notice of the governor of Wyoming and to our notice, the teacher draw, drew our attention to it. And we were able to have the pleasure of awarding medals to the two young people oh. who did this. This is the first time it's happened. And we're hoping that other schools will encourage their students to do it too. And if they do, we'll be happy to keep medals being awarded each year. Well, that is fascinating. Uh, it certainly is. Here you have the two young people and being receiving the award and their display, rather. And what the governor wrote was really encouraging to us. May I read it sure, to you? Sure, would, would you, do. Would you do. Care? All right. Um, after it was over, Governor M Mike Sullivan of uh, Wyoming wrote to each um, of the two boys as follows. I'm not sure that I've ever written to an epigrapher before, but it is a memorable occasion, particularly when my objective is to congratulate you for the medal you were awarded for the extensive work you did to create pre-Columbian messages to America. You should take pride in achieving such a success, and particularly in being so strongly endorsed by Dr. Phil. Many of us, whose years number significantly more than yours, will not realize such accomplishments in our lives. Congratulations. With best wishes, I am very truly yours, Mike Sullivan, Governor. That is we that's really, wonderful. We that's were so wonderful. grateful for the Governor for yes. sponsoring and us like that. This last issue, or the issue that's coming out right now, is on Kamakako, and you're familiar with that. Uh, Dr. Fell uh, did a one-hour documentary on Kamakako, and uh, so I'm sure that that would be a good one to start. Well, I think that's fascinating, uh, Dr. Fell, that the young people, and I've noticed young people becoming interested and in um, uh, epigraphics, in um, the uh, history of our nation, the land, and I certainly, for one, want to thank you because I think at the prime root of all this, we see your work uh, blending out and moving out into the country. And I know that it started in part with your great work, which unfortunately is no longer published, Bronze Age America. It, well, that was a fantastic work. And of course, you have America BC that uh, covers much of that ground that is in print today. We are looking for another edition of Bronze Age America. A German edition is in preparation now. Well, that's wonderful. It would be great if it comes, if we do, I certainly want to recommend it to our viewers because uh, I fortunately have two copies of it in my library and, and I'm very proud of it. One of the interesting things that happened this past year, or past two years, was the discovery, as we all remember, of the so-called Iceman in, uh, in the Alps yes. in northern Italy. Um, he had what they first thought was a bronze adds in his possession and he was assigned to the Bronze Age but later on when more careful investigations were made it was found that the adds is copper not bronze so he was then reassigned to the Copper Age which made him by far the oldest uh, known uh, human remains ever identified um, in a mummified form but what struck us over here is that the adzes that we find made by the people who uh, we're trading with King Woden Lithi at that site in Ontario. They were copper too. And not only were they copper edges, but they were the same identical shape. Um, many of our viewers will have seen the excellent article in the National Geographic magazine in which the uh, Iceman himself was depicted and his possessions 
one of which included a very beautifully shaped copper adze. Here is the identical twin brother of that adze, but this one was found in Michigan in uh, an association with objects indicating it's about, about three or four thousand years old. It was made by the Indians, the Algonquian Indians of uh, northern Michigan at that time. Uh, about a thousand other copper objects have been found in the general vicinity of the site in uh, Ontario where King Wade and Lithi was trading and we think that the ultimate source of the copper he was using was the Michigan copper which is uh, native copper, that is to say copper in metallic form not in a uh, salt of copper, metallic form that the Indians could mine and they could hammer it into this shape which for all the world is the same thing that the Iceman in Europe had. Wow, isn't that, isn't that something? Beautiful Just piece of work, precious. isn't it? It is a beautiful piece of work. Very definitely. Well, we find out that ingenuity has been with man for many, many years. And um, thank you so much for sharing this with me. pleasure. The, and again, it has been an extreme pleasure. And especially well, how exciting. Well, I'm really excited thank about you. the second witness Yes. to this alphabet. Yes. Thank you so much for having us and um, we just wish the best to you and your lovely missus and we always enjoy so much doing this documentary with you. And, thank uh, you. Thank you for all the good work that you have accomplished. I know that good works always have a little bit of pain with them but what most people have derived from it in a very strong plus in knowledge which is, and truth, it's what we seek, uh, then I want to thank you for having us again. You're very gracious, Dr. Murray. It's always a pleasure to us to have you here with your team. That's thy kingdom come. No terangi on the in the sky, kite henua, as on the earth. Kia meatia tau e pai e kite henua. Huma e mai amatu mane he kai ma matu. Motene ra kia murua o matu hara. Haka ora matu itakina. That's the liberation of evil. Thank you.